Well, welcome to those who are signing on. We're just uh, waiting a couple of minutes uh, to give people a, a, a chance. We have quite a few folks uh, interested in, in this kind of work, so I'm really excited for you to, to speak. Oh, super. So I was saying to our speaker last week, 203 seems to be our magic time <laughs> when people are, or 203 Arizona time, magic time when people are able to sign up. Yeah, I, I just want you to know, I went through some mild states of panic, wanting to make sure I had time zones right. <laughs> well, I assumed you were in, in Texas. I didn't know you were in Washington. So well, No, but, but yeah. still to know that, you know, that it's Mountain Standard Time. Okay, it's Mountain Standard Time. Well, but that kind of, because uh, some of the year we're on Pacific time and some of the year we're <laughs> mountain time. So. Yeah. Well, welcome to everybody signing on. I think we'll go ahead and, and get started. I'm really excited to be hosting Dr. Joseph Sharkey today as part of our Transcend Seminar Series. Uh, he is our sixth speaker this semester. Dr. Sharkey is a professor in the School of Public Health at Texas A&M University and earned both his MPH in Nutrition and PhD in Nutrition Intervention and Policy from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Dr. Sharkey has a wide variety of research interests, including improving nutritional, physical, emotional health across the lifespan among underserved and rural populations, with current research and community and engagement through traditional and non-traditional collaborations for improving population health. Please welcome Dr. Sharkey to uh, our, our seminar. Okay, great. Can you hear me okay? Because I took the headset off. We can, yes. Okay, great. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to present uh, some of our work. And uh, this, uh, today's presentation really focuses on our family program, uh, which we developed and implemented in the lower Rio Grande Valley of Texas, uh, just, just, uh, just across the border from uh, Mexico. I will say that uh, time permitting at the end, uh, I'll be happy to field any questions on this or we have a brand new project that we're doing right now that has to do with uh, COVID-19 and taking a family approach in working with farm workers and their families. Okay, so uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, we know that Mexican heritage children have the highest levels of childhood overweight and obesity. The families live in a state of persistent poverty. There's limitations as to the type of food choices and activity choices, especially in the areas of the colonias where we work. We also recognize that there's an influence of the family and the home and the neighborhood. Uh, we think about this somewhat from a socio-ecological perspective. And there's this rapidly expanding border and throughout the US Latino population. Uh, there was a time when we just referred to it as the growth across the border and then somewhat emerging in non-gateway areas throughout the United States, but it, it is definitely, uh, definitely expanding throughout the United States. Uh, we recognize that a family approach is critical as we think about that the family shares their eating and activity environment. And Although I'll mention some about physical activity and activity, today's focus is really gonna be on the nutrition component. We also know when we think about family that 
that parenting plays uh, an important role, whether it's one or both parents, and it really helps shape the child's dietary and activity practices. And that behavioral change really in one family, family member can serve as a model of change for the others. The child could very well be the agent of change within the family or one or both of the parents. And consistent with, with, with the culture is this family approach, familispa, uh, and where we, where we think about uh, this cultural norm and practice. But there is a gap. And as we think about trying to address uh, the problems with obesity and non-communicable uh, non disease, that there's very limited obesity-related research that really centers around Latino fathers and family. Uh, there's a gap in understanding the type of strategies that could be used for including Latino fathers. And as a result, there's this unrealized opportunity to engage uh, fathers as co-participants. From the literature, we know that there, are, that, that there have been a number of challenges that have been identified in why so few studies have included fathers. One it has to do with recruitment, being able to identify and recruit fathers, uh, being able to engage fathers in, the, in uh, these type of programs, keeping them in programs or retention, uh, motivation, and then, and then uh, definitely maintenance. And, and I'll touch on some of these as, as we go through uh, today's presentation. The setting for, the, for our program is in Hidalgo County, which is near the very southern tip of, uh, of, South, of South Texas. The areas that I have in yellow are the areas in which this study focuses, an area that we roughly call San Carlos and an area that we call Pro, uh, Progresso. And those are the shaded areas. The little dots that you may see on the screen are what are referred to as colonias. Uh, more than 70% of the colonias or neighborhoods uh, that have this kind of limited infrastructure uh, along the border, about 70% of them are in this particular county, Hidalgo County. The overall design to kind of give you a sense of the design for our project is really a, kind of a complex mixed methods design. We use exploratory work or an exploratory sequential, uh, a sequential model uh, to, to develop the formative work. This involves community advisory boards, uh, children's and mother's platicas or group sessions, elicitation surveys, and then dyadic interviews with fathers. And I'll touch on each of those. This led to the development of the intervention and the protocol with subsequent pilot testing. The overall program was implemented using somewhat of a modified step wedge cluster randomized trial with pre and post tests with multiple groups. <laughs> Excuse me, and, and, and I'll give a picture and I'll provide a picture of that. At the same time, we were doing some convergent work in observations, observations as the interventions were, as the intervention was taking place. And then following the post tests, we ended up with some explanatory qualitative work or an explanatory uh, sequential model involving interviews of uh, participants from the program. So the formative work was, uh, was, I, was developed in order to inform the development of the intervention and its implementation. And so this will kind of give you the structure that we went through. Uh, we, uh, we utilized community advisory board meetings. We had children's platicas or group discussions similar to a focus group, the same with mothers mother's elicitation surveys, father's elicitation surveys, and then father's dyadic interviews. And I'm gonna to touch, touch on, on each of those. Our community advisory boards have been, have been in existence for a while. Actually, our community advisory board in Progresso really started when we were part of a REACH project uh, uh, many, many years ago. And that particular uh, community advisory board has, main has maintained its existence since that time and through subsequent projects that we've had. Uh, in addition, we developed two additional or helped facilitate the development of two additional community advisory boards. We needed to understand more the role of the father uh, from the perspective of the child and also from the perspective of the mother and from the perspective of the father. 
So we started with children and we did what we, what we refer to as children's platicas. And the model that we adopted was a panel series. And the strength of a panel series is the same kids that are participating in session one are also participating in session two and participating in session three. And what ends up happening is as you go through subsequent sessions, the children or adults feel a lot more comfortable and are willing to share even more. So as you can see, uh, session one focused on food and we engage a lot of the visual activities. So in this particular session, we did draw, write and tell where we start with providing a drawing assignment for, for, for the kids. And, and on that assignment, they can do thought bubbles and, and do some writing. And then we would have a discussion and a discussion based on their drawings. We also did an activity called circle of closeness. And I'll show you an example of that, where we place the child in the center of these concentric circles. And the child would place other individuals in close in proximity to them uh, as far as it related to food. And then with session two, is it related to physical activity? And then they would put a star by those relationships uh, that, that, that were really important to them. <laughs> so uh, session one was on food, session two, physical activity, and session three included both. And we did photo elicitation where we provided a photo assignment at the end of session two and we uh, engage the system in, uh, engage the, the kids in somewhat of a participatory project of being able to take photographs as it related to food and physical activity. And then we use those for the conversation. We had 41 kids ages nine to 11 participate in 12 sessions in 12 groups, which meant there were 36 sessions. And of these 36 sessions, two thirds of them were in Spanish only and about one third was in, uh, was in English. And so this will give you just kind of a quick picture of, of what this uh, kind of uh, draw, write and tell would be where we've taken the, the drawing that the child created and we inserted it uh, in the actual uh, verbatim transcript of, uh, from that particular session. And so this is an example of the, uh, uh, of the circle of closeness. And what I, what, I, what I draw attention to with, with the circle of closeness is that on both examples, you'll notice that the father is at the far out, outer ring. So the father doesn't have either that frequent interactions with the child as it related to food, but you'll also notice that there's a star by the father. So that's a very important relationship. And it could be because the father works out of town or the father has multiple jobs and he's not there. But that relationship is important to the child, uh, and, and, and yet there's not as much frequency for the interactions. We followed this with mother's platypus. So <coughs> the mothers would have children in the ages of 9 to 11 years old. They were not mothers of the children who participated. This was a whole other group of mothers, and we went through uh, three sequential sessions. There were 30 mothers who participated in seven groups for a total of 21 sessions. All sessions were in, uh, in Spanish. Uh, this was followed by once, once we had a sense of what uh, the mother's perspectives were, we wanted to now develop a, a survey to put more numbers to it and to even gain, gain additional information. So we created this mother's elicitation survey and our team of promotoras uh, recruited the mothers to participate. And they completed 334 of these surveys, which included information on child's eating behavior, their physical activity, the husband's dietary, dietary behavior, background, employment, and nutrition assistance programs. So up to this point, we've gotten the perspective of children. We've gotten the perspective of mothers. Now let's get the perspective of fathers. And so we looked to the education literature and we identified the use of dyadic interviews. So with a dyadic interview, it's really, it's not a focus group and it's really more than an in-depth interview. And so what our facilitator is doing is engaging two fathers in a discussion with each other. And so in the dyadic interviews, we had 31 fathers, it should have been 32, but one father at the last minute was unable to, uh, to, to attend. So we had 15 dyads, and then we had one in-depth interview. And so they were really talking about 
what's a typical weekday, what's a typical week, uh, weekend day, thinking about uh, the, the importance of some of the activities during, during this time, their role and experiences as a father, uh, their influence or what they would like their influence to be on child's food at home, eating and cooking activities and the engagement that they have, their interest uh, in, in, in a program that would involve the, the, the family, and then, and then uh, most definitely a debrief. We follow this with father's elicitation survey. So this is a whole nother group of, of fathers who all have children nine to 11 years old. Now, I wanna go back to the dyadic interviews and say that when we recruited the fathers, we told them that this interview would last, with the two fathers would last maybe an hour, hour and a half. In actuality, the interviews lasted between two and three hours. And it was because the fathers did not want to stop talking. You know, at the end of an hour, hour and a half, we'd say, you know, we told y'all that, uh, that this would last just an hour, but if you'd like to continue, we're here. And in all cases, they wanted to continue. And so, so think about kind of the, 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 the wealth of information and the type of sharing that went between the fathers. I remember as an example, one father talking uh, to the other about uh, the difficulty ha he had with a non-biological child and just really you know, was, was having diff difficulty with that particular child at home. And the other father, father said, you know, I have, a, I have a stepson also, and here's what I do. Maybe this might work for you. And so it created this atmosphere of sharing. We saw fathers exchanging telephone numbers and contact information uh, uh, between them. So as I mentioned, we, father, we, we followed this with, with, a father's, with a father's elicitation survey. We completed, our, our team of promotors completed 300 of these. And so with the father's elicitation survey, we were asking a larger number of people what their responsibilities were, what kind of activities they participated with their child, activities with the family, uh, the degree of difficulty or what type of difficulty they had with being a dad. What, what did they feel were the benefits of uh, playing outside and being physically active with their child or cooking with their child? And then ask them about program participation. So going through this, this wealth of, uh, of formative work, what did we learn? The big thing we learned to start with was this disconnect. We heard this from our advisory boards and we also heard this from the uh, mothers and fathers. There was a disconnect because the mother's view was of the father having very little interest or not wanting to be engaged in a program like this. From the father's perspective, we found great interest, wanting to be involved, wanting to co-participate, co wanting to be a, a, a co-parent as it related to the, the health of their child. And we also learned that from the child's perspective, it was really important on whatever's going on that the father be involved. So this led to the program. And so in the development of the program, which we uh, referred to as make, make Room for Daddy, it was based on three different theories. We, we started with social, social cognitive theory and especially thinking about uh, reciprocal de determinism and, and other environmental factors. Uh, we utilized the family e ecological model, which is based on family, uh, family systems theory, and then the circumplex model of family functioning. Uh, thinking about this parent-child interactions and the influence by the overall way that the family functions. It's cohesion, it's communication, and adapt adaptability. This, this turned out to be our, conception, our conceptual model. This was developed by, by, uh, by our nutrition lead, Dr. Cassandra Johnson, who's at uh, Texas State University, and, uh, and, and really the key developer as, 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 it went, as it related to our nutrition work. So you can see the major parts of the intervention. They're in the ellipse and bolded. Experiential education, problem solving, self-monitoring, family co-participation, and goal setting. And you can see how, it's, how, how we saw that this would work on 
the individual level and then looking at this from a systems approach or a family systems approach. So how was this developed? Well, we relied a lot on the literature, our formative work, the nutrition expertise within our team. Uh, we brought in additional experts that had to do with family cohesion and communication. And a key component of all of this was our promotoras and our community advisory boards. Now the promotoras that work with us are full-time state employees. They're 100% grant funded. And years ago they coined the term and we've published this in a couple of articles that they're promotor researchers, that, they're, that, that they are schooled and have experience in, in research methods and are able to utilize these research methods, but they're first and foremost promotors, that they, they truly care uh, about, about the community. So what are some of the program components? It involves food tastings, experiential education, skill building, problem solving, a lot of these that I mentioned from, uh, from the prior conceptual model. There were six sequential sessions uh, over a six week period. Each session lasted about two and a half hours. So here are the themes for those six sessions and how one builds on the other. Healthy foundations start at home. Healthy families cook, eat and play together. Cooking with daddy is fun. Positive upbringing, upbringing and adventurous, adventurous children basic nutrition concepts, and then he healthy families moving forward. So there's six sessions. Sessions one, two, and four involved the father, the child, and the mother. Sessions three, five, and six were father, child only. So at this time when it was father, child only, we had the mothers involved in an unrelated activity, uh, crafts, a lot of other activities so that they, they, were, they were there also, but they were just not participating in that particular session. So as I mentioned, the group sessions alternated between a family triad, father, mother, and child, and, fa and family dyads, the father, child. Each session included these uh, food tastings, experiential education and skill building, uh, arts and crafts, exercises and active games, and cooking or food food preparations. Uh, there was goal setting activities that was designed to facilitate behavioral change, both in uh, nutrition and physical activity. And we felt that these, that these components work together from session to session. Uh, we previewed spotlight vegetable and we would have uh, progressive goal setting. So this will give you an example of two of the agendas, session one and session three. So, uh, each family received a family notebook. So they would receive additional pages each week that they could put in their notebook. And by the end of session one, uh, the family was involved in decorating the outside, outside of their notebook. To give you an idea of the depth of information that we provided our uh, interventionists or our promotors who, who implemented the intervention, is their research guide for each session was about 142 pages long. So that'll give you kind of the depth of information that we provided uh, our team. So the agenda for the first session, you have the welcome where there's food tastings, we had an auction, interactive lesson, uh, the decorating of the family guide and we provided all the materials. Uh, the playing and activity was an active tic-tac-toe you know, running and throwing uh, the, the kind of the bean bags on a tic-tac-toe board. Cooking together in the first session, they were making a salad from scratch and, and their own homemade vinaigrette. They had eating together, uh, talked about what they learned and then would have uh, the wrap-up session. And so session three was uh, father, and father and child only. And so you, again, you can see that there are interactive lessons, Playing and active, it's always a different activity. Cooking together, it's a different, uh, different food item and building different skills because the idea is for the child to develop these skills with the father serving as uh, the mentor for the child. Each week we spotlighted a vegetable because we were focusing on vegetables. And so you can see kind of the spotlight for two of the sessions. One was on spinach and another was on sweet potato. We would talk about the benefits, 
uh, the preparation tips and maybe some fun fact that that uh, that uh, we I identified from them. And again, all of this became part of their family uh, notebook. <coughs> the goal setting for each of the six sessions are identified here. So there was different activities that were involved in, in the goal setting for each of the session. So how did we think about training? Our promotors or community health workers, they were, they were prepared to serve as interventionists and data collectors. We had multiple days of training for each individual component. We had booster training. We had training on motivational interviewing. Uh, they, they went through quite a bit of training. Uh, we tested all the recipes and modified the recipes. Some we did some of the training in South Texas. Some we brought them uh, six and a half hours to College Station and spent several days preparing there. Other times, uh, Dr. Johnson hosted us at the nutrition at the kitchen lab there at Texas State, where again, we worked over on, on all the, the skills and on all the recipes. And so, uh, uh, it was very important that uh, program delivery would be uh, per the protocol and especially in facilitating co-participation with the father and with the child. Well, once we developed the program, we pilot tested it. And so this is an example. We started with a small pilot test just to see the time and the workability of doing this. And so we had, uh, we had two father-child pairs that we were running through the, the six sessions in six, sequential, in six sequential days. One father had uh, brought his daughter, the other father brought his son. What I remember most distinctively about this was that, uh, especially with the little girl, when they, sh when they came for the, for the very first session, she had her earbuds in, she had it connected to her cell phone, probably listening to music, sat in the chair somewhat slouching, by session two, the earbuds were gone, the phone was up, and she was totally engaged. As a matter of fact, we had during session three, we have an activity called uh, Superhero, where the father and the child each are doing drawings and colorings of the other as a superhero. And the father of the boy made the comment, he said, you know, my son is a really good artist and he draws really well. The other father, the father of the daughter says, you know, my daughter is spectacular when it comes to drawing. And for her, you could have seen her jaw drop. She had never heard her father compliment her on her drawing. And so what we found is, is during the, the pilot and then most definitely into, into the program itself, the way it established this strong connection between father and child, between mother and father, and among, and among the three of them. So we completed the session, we got the feedback, we used it to modify the program. Uh, we learned some, some really valuable things during, uh, during this pilot, and then, and then we launched the program. So I mentioned that this was uh, a modified step wedge cluster randomized trial. So we had identified 18 geographic clusters and we randomized those clusters, okay? And so then we recruited people within each of those clusters. And so what ends up happening, what you'll see with cluster one and cluster two, they both go through baseline measures at the same time. Cluster one goes through the six week program, cluster two does not. At the end of the program, both of them uh, have post measures. The post measure for cluster two becomes their baseline measure because they're followed subsequently with that blue square, which is the intervention. The purple squares that you see are three month follow up. The red squares are uh, a, six, a six month follow up. And so this will kind of give you the design. Everyone gets the intervention. It's, it's just that it becomes more of a delayed intervention. So recruitment. How do we do recruitment? Well, you build trust. And uh, we spent a lot of time, we've been, I've been working in the lower Rio Grande Valley of Texas probably for almost, tw almost 12 years. 
and involved not just in research, but we do a lot of outreach. We do a lot of community engagement, whether it's Christmas events or Halloween or back to school. And so the community knows us and they know us not just as someone coming in to have a project, collect data, go away, write papers, not to be seen again, but we really try to engage in the community. And so we also had a very purposeful strategy. As I mentioned, all those activities that we had in our formative work, as part of our consent form, we would ask people if we had uh, their permission to recontact them if there was a future study. Okay, everyone that participated, whether it's the children's platicas, the mother's platicas, the elicitation surveys or the dyadic interviews, all met eligibility requirements. And so we started with more than 600 people, 600 families that really, that, that provided us the permission to consent them uh, if there was a future study. The promotors were key. They are trusted in the community. They are very much involved in the community. We also recognize that the mother served as gatekeepers. And to a large degree, you had to get past the mother. And so uh, the promotors developed their own kind of little two minute uh, elevator speech in order to talk about what the program is, kind of the importance of the program and that they really wanted to talk to the father. And so then that was followed with direct recruitment of the father. Well, how did, we keep, how did we keep people in the study? Well, one was we did everything we could to, em to uh, emphasize uh, convenience and the perceived benefits for self and family because we learned from our formative work how important family was and how important community was to the fathers, to the mothers, to the family. It was an opportunity uh, to, for the father to spend quality time with the children and with the family. We had fathers tell us that, you know, I work at least two jobs. I know my role is to bring resources and bring money to the family. I did not realize how important it was to spend time with my child on Saturday. Uh, Retention was also providing inclusive spaces for fathers. We had father-directed activities and so many of the activities were interactive. And we had contact throughout the week uh, by, our, uh, by our promotors. As far as motivation and maintenance, we took a strength-based approach to our program. Uh, with this reciprocal reinforcement between the fathers and the children and adding humor and fun. That's why we would have a break between some of our nutrition education and a physical activity activity. Uh, or it could be some uh, lesson on, on physical activity and then we would have kind of a nutrition break. We had planned monitoring and evaluation through all, all, all aspects. Our process measures definitely included the recruitment, fidelity, dosage, and reach, but we also looked at each session's evaluation. We did observations at each time. How was it, how was a component delivered? Was it modified? Uh, and if so, how was, how, how was it modified? Our nutrition measures, uh, the timing of the nutrition measures were pre-intervention, post-intervention, which for the control group or control cluster turned out to be a transition measure or their baseline also, and then maintenance measures. So what does this involve? It involved extensive surveys, had to do with uh, confidence, food preference, you know, just a, a lot of uh, food intake, food security. We use the veggie meter uh, to measure uh, uh, carotenoids in the skin. And then we followed this with interviews. So this will give you kind of some of the pictures and, and kind of an idea of some of the activities and how we had just father and child engaged, as you see with the top right, and then father, mother, and child, as you see on the bottom. And again, the role was uh, to uh, build the confidence in the child in food preparation, build the confidence in the parents that the child could safely do this. On, your, on, the, on the left is uh, an example of the superhero. And so the father and the child would do their superhero drawings, they would talk about it, and then we put them in frames for them, these frames that came together. 
and then you'll see uh, the fathers and the children in food preparation on the right. One of our one of our promotors leading the session, uh, we utilized uh, again uh, charts. Uh, we had uh, a television screen projector which had the recipes on that, and then she would walk through it. We told her at the end she probably needed to have her own cooking show because she really got to be a pro at uh, at doing this. You'll see the eating together at the very bottom where once they've gone through the food preparation, how they're all sitting together uh, eating what they prepared that day. <clears throat> On sessions that did not involve the mother, we had mother's activities in a whole nother room there at the, at the, at the community center. And so what would happen with food preparation is that the father and child would prepare three dishes, one for the father, one for the child, and one for the mother. So here are the kids uh, with the dish that they prepared for their mother and they're getting ready to walk it over to the mothers and present their mother with uh, the food dish that they prepared for their day. And as you can tell, all the kids decorated their own aprons. And so again, this will give you an idea of more kids and all you see are happy kids. They really did enjoy this. We saw smiles on the fathers. And so, what this does is at the very end, all the families received a, a certificate of participation. We found over the years that this has great currency uh, among our population, that recognition that they participated in this type of event. At the top, you see families from one of our sessions at the, at the very end of the session, kind of taking a group picture. On the bottom, our team, our, our team there, because it takes, it takes quite a number of people to pull this off. You have those that are participating in the intervention, you have the mother's activities, and then you also have childcare because you have other kids who are not participating and there needs to be somebody to look after them and kind of entertain them. For each of the families, we provided them with a collage. And so we had a collage of pictures that were taken during the sessions and, uh, and each group was, uh, was presented this. So what, is, what does this mean? As we, as we think about inclusion of fathers. First of all, engagement of fathers is a game changer. And it's a game changer as we think about improving health, not only among the child, but among the family. That, <clears throat> excuse me, that men have important roles in family-based obesity and nutritional health programs that have traditionally focused on the mother, the child, or mother-child diets and that a family systems approach really can be considered a state, a state of the science. Collaborators on this project, uh, my team from uh, Texas A&M School of Public Health, we have a linguistics team. Now keep in mind, we have all of our materials in English and in Spanish. Uh, the physical activity was directed by our team from Baylor University, uh, Dr. Uh, Renee Umstead Meyer, directed that team. Uh, uh, Dr. Cassandra Don Johnson from Texas State University coordinated our uh, nutrition program. Our three community advisory boards in Progreso, San Carlos, and Donna San Juan. And most definitely, we really appreciate the funding from USDA uh, NEFA for this, uh, for this project that the community still talks about. And then this will give you some pictures from our community advisory boards and the engagement that, uh, that they had throughout the entire pro process of the, program, uh, of the program. And I really appreciate the opportunity to kind of talk a little bit about uh, kind of uh, what we've done. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharkey. That was an amazing talk. Um, such strong science, but but grounded in the heart of the community. Um, so I'm gonna open it up to the audience to um, either type in a question uh, and we'll answer it live, or um, if you raise your hand, I can unmute you and you can ask a question. And while folks are um, preparing to do that, I wanted to ask you, <coughs> so you, you sort of teased us at the beginning about some of the COVID work that you're doing. Can you share a little bit about that? Yes, we received, we were fortunate enough to receive a, uh, a, a two-year grant from USDA for rapid response on COVID. And so 
what what USDA was interested in was approaches to work with with farm workers. And so the idea is we're developing uh, this started September 1st. So we're developing uh, a program uh, curriculum to train community health workers about uh, SARS-CoV-2, the mitigation, uh, how to work with farm workers and these small food service providers and develop curriculum to where even the way, the way we are now to where the promotors can't really work face-to-face -face going into the homes and all, how we, how we engage the family with the farm worker on being able to protect the farm worker and protect the family. So many of our households are multi-generational. So you're thinking about not only grandma living there, but you're also thinking about real, real young ch children. So what we've done to date is we've uh, completed, a uh, we're just about complete with a national scan of all the different programs, not only the ones that might apply to farm workers, but thinking about other out outdoor workers, construction, landscape, things, things like that. We've uh, been fortunate in engaging a lot of programs throughout the country that engage community health workers, whether it's in Washington State or Cincinnati or Philadelphia or whatever it is, and they've served uh, as a strong sounding board as we're developing this curriculum, which will teach, which will teach through can, which will teach through Canvas, especially to the community health workers. It'll be free. It'll be available for everybody probably be four or five four or five uh, sessions and uh, and the, and the response that we've gotten has been really has been really strong the challenge is as y'all know this is a moving target you know what we know you know so how do we think about this and how do we think about it in cultural context you know when we first started doing some of uh, some of our conversations with uh, with folks in South Texas, Everyone knows what the recommendations are. They know what it mean, what hand washing, social distance, wearing a mask means. But for a lot of people, they don't know how to operationalize it. How do you have a family cookout and do it safely? Uh, how do you politely tell someone not to come over to your house or that you don't hug somebody when you first see them? And so thinking about all these cultural aspects, and that's and that's 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 really what we're working on. I think the next challenge is how to how how to get people to think about you can't let up even when there's a vaccine. You know, a vaccine doesn't mean that you can stop all of these safe practices. And so this is a lot of what we're working through now. So that's kind of the short the short <clears throat> the short version of it. And so it's exciting. Exciting. Yes, very exciting. When is that anticipated to be um, out? We, we anticipate having the first CHW module available by January. We'll keep, we'll, we'll let us know. Uh, I will, I will. No, because we're making it available, available to, to, to anybody. You know, we, you know, we've also engaged some of our former uh, collaborators. We used to, uh, we collaborate with Mariposa down there in Nogales, and so you know uh, uh, Patty and everybody there have been so have been so wonderful that you know we definitely want to to make it available. Fantastic. Uh, so there's a question from one of the audience members. Um, Christy asks, uh, "Can you tell us more about your future interventions and what those might look like?" Uh, I think what we wanted to, the the key to to all of it's going to be funding. Uh, <laughs> We found, I mean, this is incredibly resource intense. You know, if you, th if you think about it, the, the, the things I didn't talk about is just the logistics. First of all, you can't have a whole lot of families at any one time because of space. You know, uh, if you're thinking of a father, mother, and a child doing food prep and an instructor there, how many, I mean, w in one session, we had as many as nine families and that was stretching it you know, to think and, and, and be able to provide the, the supervision and all. I think, I think our next thing, what I wanted to do, because we had, had, had a, a program here in Washington State that we tried, we called it Cooking with the Seasons. And, and up here, we have three growing seasons. And so we were tying parent-child dyad with, with the Growing with the Season. 
And in year two, we added the Instant Pot. And so what I'd like to do would be to expand that intervention in South Texas and add the Instant Pot to it. Because, you know, so many of the soups, so many of the other dishes that it doesn't use a lot of electricity, doesn't use a lot of utensil, I mean, a lot of different pans, and think about ways of making hot dishes, you know, in, in an easy way, but yet uh, more, tra more traditional dishes. Super exciting. Uh, so Gabby asked, what do you feel is the biggest obstacle of including fathers in the mealtime environment? In the, in the mealtime environment or in, a, in this type of program? If, if you're uh, thinking about the mealtime environment, I, would th I, I think it's going to be work schedules, you know, and it's going to be the time of the year. You know, I think about in South Texas, so many of the kids are on a school bus and they're on a school bus for a long period of time. Uh, most of our school districts in South Texas are consolidated school districts, which means that, you know, in, in one part of the state, in one part of the county, there's as many kids in that school district as there, as there are in Kansas City. And yet this is an all, all functionally rural. So kids are on a school bus at least 45 minutes each way, each day. But I think the other part has to do with, uh, with, fa with father schedules. But we found in the feedback that we've gotten since, since the program is that they're making time for it. It may not be every day, but it'll be several times a week. The big thing that we've gotten uh, that, that, that families have adopted is having conversations at, at dinner. No, it's a no technology zone. So there are no cell phones, no computers, nothing. And, and they talk about each other's day or they may start the meal and write, uh, write a topic and put it in a jar. And then during the meal, they'll draw a topic out and just talk about it. I think, I think that's more what we saw. Initially, when we proposed this project, we had essentially three outcomes we were looking at. One was dietary, which would be increased fruits and vegetables. Another was physical activity. And the third at that time was, was reduced sedentary behavior. As we developed the program, that fell off, the sedentary behavior. And what it was replaced with was family cohesion and family dynamics. And that's because, because you'll see as I talk about the program, how that's woven throughout. And that's really the key. Uh, during session four, which is mother, father, and child, we have a separate child's activity. And then we have a separate activity that's for the, the fathers and the mothers together. It's on communication and it's using I statements and, it, and, it's, and it's the ways they communicate. We had, we had uh, uh, couples tell us, I didn't know that about the other. You know, it was a way of facilitating it because it wasn't that it was not anything they didn't want to do. They didn't know how, you know, because if you think about how people are modeled, you know, as they grow up, you know, especially if you come from an, from an area where all the father did was work, you know, what, what type of modeling did they see? And so we were creating that kind of modeling. Uh, I remember in particular, we had one father who worked in Laredo. Okay, Laredo is more than two and a half hours from, uh, more, from McAllen, and he worked there all week. But he found the program to be so important that he would get up early in the morning, he would drive from Laredo to McAllen, participate in the program, be there, and then drive back to Laredo. And so this is the type of, uh, of, of, of reaction that, that we saw. I'm probably not answering your question because I do go off on tangents. No, you, you totally you did. I mean, but I actually want to ping off of what you said. Um, <laughs> so what is, uh, the what this the person that asked the question says I love I love your tangents that was perfect. Um, so you actually said how um, you clarified around the question and can you I wanted to follow up with that. Uh, so what was the most challenging thing in engaging fathers in the program? Uh, again, it had to do with schedule rather than meal time. Uh, and because we were asking them. Okay. For each cluster, okay. we do, for each cluster, we divided them into two groups. 
that they were that they could choose from a morning session or an afternoon session. I think two things that that, that happened. One was um, the flexibility that they could move back and forth between the session depending on family activities, which worked perfect. The other was one father in particular came came to us and said, you know, your the sessions run from let's say uh, 10 to 12:30. I have to be at work uh, by noon, and but I want to participate in the program. And so we said, okay, let's have let's have a meeting with all the families that are part of this session. And they decided as a group they would start early so that that father could be there the whole time. But it had to be a group decision. It was not going to be our decision. CBPR work at its best. Um, another question was, within your research, have you found that fathers and mothers have different uh, parenting practices? Absolutely. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, not only do they have different parenting practices, you think about these cultural roles, you know, of uh, what the fa what the father looks at, it's especially what the mother thinks the father's role is, you know. I mean, early in when we were doing the formative work, when we first made uh, 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 talked about this project with our community advisory boards, the first community advisory board we talked to, which is primarily women, I think there's one man in the group, but it's primarily women in that community advisory group, they said, why do you even want the fathers? They're useless. They don't know anything. They don't care, you know. And but but it took over over a period of time this idea that and part of its communication. Father really wanted to know. He wanted to know what it, what what he could do to help be careful, and uh, to help the family be healthy. Excuse me. But at the same time, for the mother not to feel that she's threatened as far as the value of what she does. You know, because with so many of the mothers, they're queen of the kitchen. You know, uh, for so many of them, they're cooking from the time they get up in the morning until they go to bed, you know, with uh, with uh, with different kids. So it, it, it was really it was really kind of uh, kind of getting getting through, you know, these stereotypical roles or that if parents are engaged, it's the father with physical activity and the mother with food. But then we think about, well, who's doing the grilling? <laughs> who's doing the barbecuing, you know? And, uh, and, and, and we found uh, that, that it really was that communication between, between father and mother and breaking through the stereotypes. Awesome. I wonder if we could switch gears a little bit and if you could talk about a little bit more about engaging promotoras in your work and, and where you see promotoras and, and making an impact in community health? They're critical. I can't say, I can't say enough about, uh, about the promotoras. Uh, years ago, I would always, I would always tell people, they, they would say, how do you hire promotoras? And I would say, I don't hire promotoras. My promotoras hire other promotoras. And, and to this day, if I ask them, ask any of them, what does it take to be a promotora? They would instinctively say, it takes heart. You have to care about the community. Skills you can train, but somebody either, either has it or doesn't have it as to whether or not they care about the community. Uh, I find that the promotoras are key. They serve as that cultural bridge. They're my mentors when it comes to knowing the community. Uh, over the years, I've learned if they said that something wasn't appropriate to do or to talk about, it didn't happen. I wasn't going to do it. You know, I so value them and in all areas of what I do. I think it's really important in working with promotors not to look at them as just recruiters or just gatekeepers. They need to be equal partners. And we do research and we do outreach. We do a lot of outreach. And I give them, I provide them with the opportunity to make decisions, to make recommendations, you know? And I really do trust, trust what they say. 
it was Promotors that, that several years ago, we were doing a lot of our community, uh, community assess, assessments where we would, uh, they would survey people in the community. We had one year where they surveyed over a summer, 2,600 people recruiting door to door, on the doorstep, doing a, doing a survey. And it was during that activity, one of the promotors came up to me and said, you know, we do so much on the nutrition. Here's some, we're missing something. I said, well, what's that? They said, mental health. We're seeing a lot of bullying. We're hearing about this. We need to include mental health. From that day on, we've always included mental health in what we do, you know? And, it's, and it really is listening to them. But I, but I mean, I can't say enough. We just submitted uh, an abstract to, I guess, the, a, a farm workers meeting that's going to take place. This is a national meeting that's going to take, take place next spring. Who are the presenters? The, my, my promotors. Who's not, who's not on the abstract? I'm not on the abstract. It's them. Because I want them to have the recognition for this is what they do and this is who they are. It's amazing. <laughs> no, it really it, it is. I've I've learned so much from the the other thing is recognizing that they need to have the freedom to address emergent issues. We may be doing a nutrition study, but if someone has a, a, an issue, maybe they know somebody who's uh, dealing with uh, uh, partner violence or something like that. They need to be empowered to provide information to that person at that time. And so I think it's really respecting them, their role, and their relationship to the community. How long have the promoters worked with you? Like, so have you had like the same core group of folks or? If, <laughs> so much of it is based on funding because they're all soft money funding. Uh, one of my team members now has been with me maybe seven years. And, you know, and, and we had a period of time where there was like two months where she what didn't work, you know, or we figured out a way to do some type of uh, bridge. Uh, I've had as many as uh, eight or eight or nine promotors at one time. I now have, well, for this, for the, the family program, I had six uh, right now, I have two. So it, you know, so much of it is is it's funding dependent. I think the other thing is helping them develop skills that once they leave the project, they're more marketable for other things, and that's what I think is also important. Absolutely. Are there any other questions from the audience members? Well, Dr. Sharkey, thank you so much for such a fabulous presentation. It really was perfect um, uh, and really, really exciting as a, as a community nutrition myself. You're, just, you're singing to the choir, um, but I really appreciate the work that you do. Um, for our audience members, uh, we have one more speaker this semester. We have Dr. Sharon Donovan um, changing up uh, gears again. She's gonna talk about the gut microbiome and the prevention of childhood obesity. Um, but again, thank you so much, Dr. Sharkey. I My wish pleasure. you a happy Thanksgiving and uh, yeah. please, please wear your masks and social distance. Oh, and yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye.